Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. I have to lament something for just a moment here. Ooh. Something that I <laughs> something that I'm just starting to get I don't know if it's perturbed or annoyed or just like it's starting to drain on me, starting to wear on me yeah. over time. Yeah. So this is Joel's Lamentations. My Lamentations. Chapter one, verse one. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is probably chapter like 30, verse 1. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> the story continues. Uh, this whole notion that I see on social media and in the world that the, the phrase studies show dot, 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 and then fill in the blank of some study from some, you know, I don't, association, college, newspaper, it drives me crazy. It absolutely drives me crazy because it's like... It, how many studies conflict each other? They're supposed to be peer reviewed. They are. And then like all these studies are, they're coming out to try to prove things. And I'm reading these studies and I'm going, you know, like the summary of them. I don't actually go and read many of them, but the summary that I'm reported by the news or the media or somebody points to. And I'm like, this doesn't resonate with what I think reality looks like or how I've experienced my life. I feel like I'm being manipulated with this. I feel like somebody's gotten some you know, some statistics and some numbers together and they're weaving a narrative from those numbers and then they're telling me how to think or believe or perspective something. And I'm like, this is BS, man. How many studies do we have to keep throwing around? And people are, well, how can you prove that? Where's your study to back that up? And they, everybody's like throwing this around. Like this is the, the Bible of the new world or something. Like we have these I, article studies and all this stuff. I don't know, I'm I'm really I'm on a rant right now, as you can tell. It's just like really <laughs> bothering me. <laughs> it's it, because it's it's this it's this sense as I move through the world, and, and you know most people talk about this idea of common sense. I don't know if I believe in common sense because I don't know if most people have common sense, but there's a sense of I kind of know like I have a sense inside myself how reality works. Right? I just I just kind of have a sense of it, a general sense of it. I think we all do as humans. And when these quote unquote studies come out and they fly in the face of kind of how I've always seen things and other people have seen things, and especially if you, if you say it out loud, like, well, I don't think that's how, well, the study doesn't say that, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, but how can you go against something that you like is kind of common, quote unquote, common sense inside of yourself and knowing you have? I want to talk about this today because I feel like it's getting worse and I want to maybe provide some thinking around how we can move through the world without just handing ourselves over to a bunch of lab coat journalists, doctor, professor type people. <laughs> and nothing's wrong with any of those careers. But my God, like, come on, there's got to be a little bit of a balance here, right? Okay. All right. There's a lot to unpack there. And before we lose our entire thinker, side of our audience <laughs> or anybody well, <laughs> who has a strong relationship with the cognitive function of introverted thinking or accuracy. Well, I'm not saying throughout logic or reason. Right. That's no. not what I'm suggesting. Well, well, like I said, there's a lot to unpack. So let's, sure. let's dive into the subject because I think it's something that is top of mind for me as well. It's this idea of inner knowing and how do we get to a place of inner knowing and is inner knowing even a thing? Okay. So let's start with studies that people conduct. Yeah. And if a study is done well, it's not intended to be a piece of proof to run around social media slapping other people's ideas out of their hands. It's supposed to be something that is attempting to get to the nucleus of how reality works. And so there's I do think that there's a distinction between studies and how people use studies. Yeah. And that should be, I think that that distinction should be kept clear. It reminds me of my old theology days going to a seminary, right? Like, use Bible text to prove something to other people. Oh, the Bible says it here. This paragraph in the Bible proves this thing. It's like, that's what modern studies feel like to me now. Yeah, well, because uh, what, what, they, what do they call that? They call that interpretation. And when you have a worldview, you're going to use whatever you think is the the biggest hammer, right? The strongest tool to support your worldview. And so you're going to use things like biblical passages for the religious types or studies for you know, everybody who's more secular as your big hammer, as the interpretation, or you're going to interpret those studies in a way that supports your worldview. Now, unfortunately, we have also seen that studies themselves are not always kept free from bias. And that is a problem because, this again, those studies conducted are intended to find the nucleus of reality, 
not to prove anything. If proving something specific, even though, you know, you start out with a premise and you're trying to test your premise, that's something. But that's different than trying to prove, say, a political worldview or a way you want reality to pan out (laughs) in order to support whatever's underneath that worldview, right? Your paradigm. And unfortunately, things like peer review are losing some of their uh, some of their oomph because there have been people who have pushed against that entire you know sort of infrastructure and discovered that there's holes in that too. But that said, studies are still how we figure things out when it comes to anything that has you know even sort of a scientific bent. So I don't really want to demonize studies themselves unless obviously they do have a strong layer or film of bias around them. That, of course, is highly inappropriate. But studies themselves shouldn't be demonized, I don't think. That said, the weaponizing of them is definitely a problem. And particularly in a landscape of people who are all trying to beat other people over the heads with their opinions, worldviews, and political affiliations by using these studies. That said, I don't, I don't think this podcast is really about studies and how we're using them. I think it's more about the thing that lives underneath that that you mentioned, which is, well, if somebody's using a study or statistics or data that was mined or something that was put in, you know, some, you know, a journalist references in, uh, you know, an article or whatever, and they're using that to counter something that feels contrary to a sense of inner knowing. What is that inner knowing? Does the, it, does the inner knowing have a right to take precedence over the information that can be called in the outside world? Is that inner knowing worth, you know, really looking at and trying to figure out what it is? Or is inner knowing always just a subjective, you know, desire to believe whatever you want to believe? And it should always be set aside or marginalized or trumped with these studies, statistics, even if they end up being interpretations of them. I mean, does that get to the heart of what you're talking about, Joel? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's these things, there's an inner knowing, inner meaning, inner wisdom that I think we all carry as humans. How do you measure that? How do you how do you measure the inner world that we all move through the, the space with? And then the other thing is our perceptions skew everything. Like you show me a reality outside of the perceptions I use to interpret that reality. Like I, you can't, there's no way to get to me without using my perceptions and my filters to give me that information or for me to experience my world. In other words, you know, like as I move through the world, my eyes, ears, all the perceptions that I, all the, the actual tools I use to perceive my world are skewing the information for me in the way that I'm wired to skew that information. And so it's impure by the time it hits me, meaning I have to rely on some of that inner knowing and wisdom even more as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, and I would say that this is a gift of postmodernism, even though there's a lot of things that postmodernism takes from us. One of the gifts is that it reminds us through just constant and perpetual reminders that we are all living in a very subjective reality, that every single person has a different definition of reality. And we're looking for people to sync up with that are as close or, you know, as a close approximation to our personal reality as possible. And then we feel very galvanized by that. We go, well, this is my perception of reality. And and doesn't everybody agree? And then, oh, come to discover there's a bunch of people who don't. And so then we're looking for people to help us feel a little bit more certainty about those interpretations. And then sometimes I think what we end up doing is because we're looking for that certainty so badly, we're looking for that sense of galvanizing that then we start to gerrymander our own inner knowing and inner wisdom. We start to gerrymander it to, to be sort of a, a circling of the drain of what we, we thought deep down inside. But we do that in order to, to sync up with others because it's very lonely to have your own completely subjective, very individualistic interpretation of reality. It's very lonely, and there's no real sense of certainty there at all. But if we can lock into a bigger group or a bunch of people who think kind of similar things, but then we say, well, well, we're going to put a soundbite to this. We're going to put a a specific political affiliation or specific religious affiliation and then we're going to create codification around it and then we're all going to buy into this thing because it's as close to our subjective opinion as possible you know as we could have possibly gotten 
And uh, and then we're just going to all align ourselves with that. And then now that becomes our worldview. That becomes our point of view. And so in, in those moments, what started out as maybe an inner knowing or an inner sense then itself got hijacked in order to be able to feel like we're a part of a group, like we're not the only ones seeing it from this perspective. And if you have so many of those, and then all of those, you know, they, they get born out of this desire for certainty, those groupings, those, you know, worldviews, those point of views, all of those, anytime you get like, you know, enough numbers, that those numbers were built from everybody in there desiring a sense of certainty. So of course, they're going to find people who disagree with them to be very much threatening because they wanted certainty to begin with. And they gerrymandered their own inner knowing to have those numbers, to have that sen sense of certainty. In fact, I would argue that a lot of times we are betraying our inner wisdom when we join a group think of any kind. Anytime we lock into a large group of people all thinking relatively the same thing, we are to some extent betraying that inner knowing because we had to gerrymander it to fit that group. And so not only do people outside of that that disagree with us, not only do they threaten our sense of certainty, but they also risk exposing what we gave up to be a part of that collective thought. I think in a postmodern world, I mean, if you think about it, like where does the authority lie? for the things that we do in the world. So, you know, one country is hostile to another country. How do we as a society determine which country to take sides on? I mean, there's no like God telling us what's right or wrong. It's from a praxology, you know, framework, it's might makes right. It's the biggest coalition gets to call the shots in a postmodern world because there's no authority that we're looking at. It's, it, I mean, the only authority we really have is a subjective inner authority. Well, and going back to that idea of interpretation, even if there was a God, the I, the thoughts of God would have to be interpreted. And so, like you said, it all goes back to inner knowing and inner wisdom. The interpretation ends up having to be something that we have to pull from within. And I think that's the real challenge. And so I just realized we probably picked up some listeners from our 16 personality type interview series. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and now we're back to you. Antonio wants to talk about woo-woo stuff. <laughs> well, Joel wants to lament, actually. That's how it kicked off, didn't it? Right. Joel <laughs> wants to lament, and Antonio wants to talk about woo-woo stuff. So yeah, we do talk about personality types, I promise. <laughs> but just every once in a while, we go off on a tangent, a very intuitive tangent. So uh, it's not every week, but here we are. But I want to go back to that idea of the might mix right, because I think you were building on my idea of what we sometimes give up you know, that inner knowing, we give up a little bit of it in order to be a part of a larger group of voices in order to feel that sense of certainty. Well, and empowerment. I mean, might makes right. If I'm part of the group, I also have some empowerment. I feel like I'm mighty. I can, I'm part of the winning team, right? I want to be on the winning team. I don't want to be on the losing team of one person, myself and my own inner knowing. I want to join the team that's winning in the world and making things happen in the outer world and doesn't get punished for it, right? That's I think that's our our desire as humans, and we're very social creatures. We want to sync up with others and make sure that we're not going against the, the flow too much. Yeah. And I suspect that if all of us were tapped into our inner wisdom and our inner knowing, we probably would resonate with other people a lot more often than we do even now. We would all be humming at a certain frequency of inner knowing, which doesn't mean that we would always agree on the incidentals. We wouldn't always agree on the, you know, the the how to solve major world problems or so, you know, the solutions to the things that we experience. But I think that we would be more tapped into each other's good intent. Uh, we'd be tapped into each other's, you know, sort of like a, a there's a frequency people hum at when they're really in touch with that inner knowing and inner wisdom. And it creates a speed of trust. There's a trust that we have with people who are who are listening to that part of them. And I think that we trust those people more than we trust people who are running around collecting studies to back up what they have to say, that we can instinctively feel that that's a sense of insecurity that the individual has with the, you know, what they're proffering, their worldview, their opinion, you know, their take. 
there's a sense of insecurity if they have to gather all of this information around. But the other person also probably feels insecure if that's the level the debate is at. Because for every piece of every study and every piece of information or data that supports your worldview or your position or your take, the other person is going to find something that is the opposite worldview or or opposite enough to to, you know, diminish the power of the statistic or the data that you brought forth. So before we get too in down this rabbit's hole, let's define what inner wisdom and inner knowing even is. Is it intuition? Is it the loudest voice inside your head? Is it just an instinct or a gut? What exactly is inner knowing and inner wisdom? I don't think it's intuition. I think intuition is the imaginative part of us. It could be inwardly focused. Like introverted intuition, for example, comes from within us. Right? There's an intuition that's inside of our minds, inside of ourselves. But I don't think it's that. And I don't think it's, I don't actually I don't think it's related to functions at all. I wouldn't think it's introverted sensing or memory. I don't think it's the impressions of the things that have come before because we got those written onto us through our external experiences anyway. I don't even think it's our introverted feeling or authenticity of who we are and our motivations and the sense of self and the sense of identity. I don't think that's what I'm talking about. Although I mean, I'm introverted feeling as an ENFP. So my authenticity process that I'm sure there's some of that that feels flavored there. And I'm, I don't think it's the uh, introverted thinking or accuracy process either of the logic and the sense making. I think that inner knowing may use those functions as tools to communicate with us as people. Like it might communicate through my introverted feeling because that's what resonates with me. That's how my mind rewards me for making decisions as an ENFP. And you listening, maybe your inner wisdom communicates through those functions for you, those inner, you know, introverted functions. But I don't think it's those functions themselves that's wisdom or knowing. Yeah, I agree. I think it lives underneath all of that. And I like the word that you used, tools. I think that mm. it uses some of these, or at least we can use them as tools to be able to get to those spaces. But I mean, when I'm really tapped into my inner knowing and, it, and we should probably create a distinction between inner knowing and inner wisdom as well, because I don't think that those are exactly the same thing either. I think knowing is more descriptive and wisdom is more prescriptive. Yeah. Like an inner knowing is the thing that you just sense that you can experience. And inner wisdom is the, it's, it's the, uh, the trajectory it encourages you to go down, right? It's the advice that ends up coming from your inner, your inner knowing. As I think about inner knowing too, I think maybe, maybe, I don't think it's instinct, but instinct might be the closest thing that we could label it as, mm. right? Like the first time that you have sex with someone, you have a sense of how to position yourself and how that works, right? I mean, nobody taught you that, like hopefully no adult taught you that as a child because that would be inappropriate, right? Usually like the sexual experience, for example, is a is a hands-on experience. You fumble your way through it a little bit, but there's a sense of knowing kind of what almost like an instinctual or experiential element, a knowingness about this based on our physiology, based on how, you know what I mean? Like it's this, it's this sense of something that just comes from within. Hmm. I don't even think it's that actually. You know, there's the, there's the instincts, like you said, like there are certain things that we just have to figure out on our own. And humans have less of that than most of the other animals a lot of animals come out walking and able to feed themselves on the first day like the first hour we come out barely being i mean we just we have to be completely protected <laughs> for a really long time and uh, and it's because we're not fully formed right our, our our brains are too big our craniums are too large we have to come out before those get too big to you know exit the passage um and and so because of that, we, we're, we're almost a little half-baked when we come out. But regardless of that, we all have those instincts. But I don't, you know, the instinct to eat and the instinct to nurse and the instinct to eventually, you know, adjust our eyes to be able to see things and, and you know, all, everything that comes later. But I don't, I don't think it's that either. Yeah, I, th I think it's deeper than that. I'm saying that's like an access point almost. It's like mm -hmm. that's like the the next level down to the instinctual level, like that kind of thing, right? Like you said, like the, these things that we're drawn toward physiologically almost, you know, like sunlight and some of these things, yes, they're instincts animalistically, but there's something about them that feels just also beyond instinct. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, and I guess one could argue that this world, this contemporary world, has taught us how much of those things are tied in with our inner knowing because we actually deny ourselves basic human desires, instinctual desires, by staying inside the house too much and looking at backlit screens too much and living our lives vicariously through simulations and video games when everything inside of our inner knowing says, get out of the house and put your feet in some grass. You know, go get some vitamin D. Like, stress your body so that builds muscle. You know, push your, push yourself. And this idea of, like, challenge and, getting, and overcoming challenges, that's how we get to things like self-confidence. And, like, we have all of these inner knowings that encourage us to do things that are instinctual. And the contemporary world, we have such a a synthetic world set up for us that we deny ourselves those things and then we experience it we experience the problems the fallout of not listening to those instincts so i would say that that inner wisdom and that inner knowing it knows those things too right i don't think it's the same as those right the instincts but it knows that those instincts must be honored and it encourages us to go that direction it says those instincts need to be listened to go do those things and when we ignore that, when we are, ignore our inner wisdom telling us that, then we we suffer the consequences. And the other challenge here too is we have to talk about it in digital terms of reason and logic. Like even the word "knowing" is imprecise because it's it's a reasoned word. It's about like knowledge and information, which it's not exactly what we're talking about, right? We're talking about it's more of an inner experientialness, quote unquote. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like knowing, know it breaks down the moment you put a like a thinking label to it. It makes it very cerebral. It puts it up in the head. And it, and it and to reduce it down to the labels of instinct puts it too much in the body. Yeah. It's something between these two tension points of, yeah, experientialness. I love how every time you talk about it and try to put it into to words, the words just sort of fizzle out towards the yeah. end of them. <laughs> well, but that's, the, that's the challenge here. We ha- we're trying to talk about it in a very like accessible way. So you, you listening can tap into this conversation and join with us. Yeah. I mean, that's how we have to do it as humans. We use words, digital language, all this stuff that we're trying to communicate with, but... That dances around something that can't be digitalized. Exactly. And yet here we are again, right? Antonio wants to talk about woo-woo stuff. <laughs> so uh, I think on top of this is, you know, that instinct part, but there's also a divine energy that comes in here. I know, I'm getting woo, but there's a sense of our inner knowing and our inner wisdom also being tapped into something bigger than us that encourages us to do the right actions that aren't just right for us as a human animal, that aren't just right for us as an individual, but are right for us as part of a collective, right? A collective unconscious. And so there's these these messages we get that help us tap into the unique expression of humanness that we individually are, without veering too far away from a, you know, a, a, a general human experience. Like we have to individuate in the sense that we are. When I say have to, I just mean we do, right? We have to because we do. That's what we do as humans is we individuate. But by the same token, if we get too far away from what it means to be human, then that's not healthy either. We don't, we're not on our path when we go feral. We're not on our path when we become too animalistic and start hurting people. There's nothing about that that our inner wisdom would be, you know, would be whispering in our ear to go do because that's not that's never led to happiness for anybody. And I think that's part of what our inner wisdom and our inner our inner knowing does for us is it helps keep us on a trajectory. It's like a calibrative voice inside. And maybe that that's just how I interpret everything. But it's a it's a voice that lets us know what we should be doing despite what we personally want. And I think maybe that's one of the best ways that I interpret this inside of my own mind, or maybe this is how I explain it to myself, is it's the voice deep down inside that doesn't care about all of my biases. It doesn't care about what I want to think. It doesn't care about my wounding. It doesn't care about my insecurities or the challenges I have or anything that I'm going, yeah, but that isn't fair. It doesn't care about any of that. It's a voice that holds strong deep inside of me that if I can listen, if I can get quiet enough to listen to that discreet voice, it has messages for me that have not yet let me down. Like it always sends me the right direction. 
And I've seen this as a coach. What I try to do when I'm coaching someone is I'm trying to get them to be able to hear that voice inside of themselves. And that's my job. My job isn't to tell them what to do. My job is to have them hear that voice for themselves and look for all of the obstructions in front of it. Like that's that's part of what I do as a diagnostic because we can't always identify all of the gatekeepers we've placed between ourselves and that voice. They're the emergence of a lot of pain or self-protectiveness. Most of the voices or the obstructions between ourselves and that inner knowing are things that are afraid of pain. They're afraid of suffering. They're pushing us away from anything that gives us a sense of uncertainty or gives us a sense of unknowing. The sense that if I go down a path that is unfamiliar, if I end up doing something that is being directed by this quiet internal guide that I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I I can't predict that. And I don't know if I'm going to be in a controlled environment or space. So I'm going to set up all of these obstructions in front of me in that voice to to ensure that it doesn't encourage me to do anything that's so outside of my comfort zone that I don't know if I'm going to last there. I don't know if I'm going to be okay. And a lot of times those come from effectively, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking the language of insecurity. It's just most of the time what comes between us and those and that deep inner knowing is insecurity. It's a fear that maybe we developed when we were young or it's messages from the people who are influential, influential in our life that encouraged us to see things in a way that were contradictory to how we're naturally wired to see things. There are voices that make us doubt our makeup or our intrinsic worth or value. They don't give us space or maybe we don't feel like we had space to be who we are, which is one of the reasons why you and I love typology so much is because it's an incredibly validating system and maybe we didn't get enough validation. So now we're sitting in a pool of feeling invalidated and what, like we can't trust our intrinsicness and yet here's this, this, this dist- discreet voice inside trying to tell us, no, our intrinsicness is the ultimate guide. <laughs> and we're going, no, we can't do that because every message I ever got was don't trust yourself, don't trust that voice, don't trust how you're wired, don't trust anything about yourself. Just go on a path that has been prescribed for you, go on a path that worked for me, whoever that person was that said go on a path that I want for you, and just shut down all those voices because trust me, don't trust that. I have a lifetime of being told that since I was very little as a child, when I could first understand the message was you cannot trust yourself. You cannot trust your own inner meaning or wisdom. And you need to hand yourself over to an external authority, external structure, because you just don't have that. And it really erodes self-trust. And fast forward, I've spent years undoing all of that. And now, you know, in our modern world, if I trust myself, I'm maybe I'm I'm filled with misinformation. <laughs> you know, well, you don't have it right. You don't you don't know. And we're going to show you studies that prove that your inner knowing is wrong, Joel. I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I spent a lifetime getting myself away from that religious external forcing me to see it the way you see it out here. And not that I want to act badly toward others or or hurt the system of the external world. Like, I don't want to have an inner knowing, which I don't have this, but like an inner knowing, oh, murder's okay. So I'm just going to, I think that's okay to do. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about a sense of self, a sense of knowing, a sense of self-trust. And people really struggle right now with sense of self-trust. And I think it's partly due to this. It's partly due to we don't allow people to even have the moment to see what their inner voice is or what their inner wisdom is telling them. Because maybe they would bring it into the outer world and it's not exactly how it's supposed to match out here. And so they get shut down or canceled or silenced or marginalized or told they're stupid or don't see it right or don't have a study to back it up. And it's like, that's that's crazy because how are we supposed to work through maybe not all the great parts of what we have inside of ourselves if we can't just express it a little bit, work on it, have it out here, have space for messing up a little bit. Maybe I don't have it right yet. Maybe I'm still working through my inner knowledge and wisdom. Maybe I don't, you know, maybe I have to express it to find it. 
Maybe it's a process for me. How am I supposed to be perfect and bring out the exact inner knowledge right now? I might have some inner knowledge that's got coloring with trauma or bad code or other things that get globbed onto it. I'm trying to get through all that. And I think we should give space for people in this process. And I would appreciate space for that. You know, I'm sure I've said things on this podcast that if I look back, I'm like, yeah, that's not exactly what my inner wisdom believes now after doing this for you know, the time of this recording over almost eight years. Uh, there's things I would recalibrate, rethink about. But the process of being able to talk them out, work them out loud, bring out that inner knowledge, and then play with that, especially in a postmodern world, I think is extremely valid. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. I I wonder, well, I mean, I don't wonder. I think one of the challenges here and one of the reasons why people push so hard against each other is, yes, it's hard to give yourself permission to have an inner knowing without something to back it up or without that strength in numbers piece. I personally believe that every single time we use tribal thinking to borrow certainty for our position, we are by definition gerrymandering our own inner wisdom to match that tribe's logic in order to feel that safety in numbers. So in that sense, again, like I mentioned before, we've already compromised our inner wisdom on some level or our inner knowing. And why on earth we would give other people permission to have their inner knowing if we didn't give ourselves permission to have it Yeah. because we lacked a sense of certainty and we wanted to borrow it. So you can see why it becomes a problem in any platform that creates a battle mentality of my truth versus your truth. But I think a real challenge here is that inner knowing is going to be by definition contradictory because it depends on what moment in the timeline you're at. What is true for you 10 years ago is not necessarily true for you now. And different points of view need to be represented. Like I just recently made a tweet that said, I choose freedom over safety in the raising of my daughter. And somebody accurately called out, they're like, well, that's probably because you're an EP type. And I had I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's because I'm an EP type. They said they asked their IJ friends if they would make the same comments. Also, our daughter's EP as well. Right, absolutely, and and you are too. <laughs> this is a very EP household. <laughs> and they said they asked their IJ friends, and their IJ friends said that they would completely switch that around. They would choose safety over freedom in the raising of their children. And I I mentioned yeah because they need to steward the concept of safety and I need to steward the concept of freedom because both need to be represented in the world. And so... And our kids will get the brunt of it. Yeah, right. <laughs> of whatever our thing is we're supposed to be doing. Right. And my and my child might steward something else. I mean, she's a little EP type, most likely. That's our, uh, that's our guess. And so she probably is also going to be a steward of the concept of freedom. But that said, there's that inner knowing what's right for me is not necessarily right for the other person. And that, of course, we're talking about our subjective life choices, which is different than our conceptual, you know, paradigmatic, this is how reality should be constructed choices. But on some level, they're, they're the same thing. On some level, my inner wisdom and my inner knowing about how I should be showing up and the things that I should be representing are going to very much flavor my worldview. And I'm going to be a steward of that worldview. Does that mean that I'm inherently wrong with that worldview? Well, I would be if it was a, somebody else's worldview. If their worldview matched mine, that would be wrong for them. And that includes the micro and the macrocosmic version of those worldviews. So on some level, if we're all representing our inner wisdom or our inner knowing, there's going to be inevitable contradictions. So we have to rest into that too. And that's one of the challenges with inner knowing. But I think the stickiest element of all of this, the thing that really puts a stick in the spoke, is that 
it's hard to get to that inner knowing or that inner wisdom if you do have a bunch of biases and agendas that you haven't personally acknowledged. It is very easy to conflate what my inner wisdom is telling me versus what I want to believe. And how do you know which one it is? As I mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast, is inner knowing slash inner wisdom. We're using, I'm using them almost interchangeably, even though we did decide that one is more descriptive and the other is prescriptive, but they're kind of sort of, they're cousins, right? They're, they're or more like siblings. They're, they're a very similar concept. How does one determine the difference between those and just what I want to believe, right? Is it the loudest voice in my head? Is it just the thing that's speaking loudly or is it just a compulsion that I have or just an instinct or how can I tell the difference between those two things and accurately represent what my inner knowing is is whispering in my ear versus all the other voices inside that are telling me to go wherever they want me to go? It's been my experience that the more I really resonate with an inner knowing or inner wisdom, it's not a single answer. In fact, it's a paradox or a tension point between opposites. And it's almost like it's and. It's not either or. It's and. And it applies to things like timelines like you talked about, Antonia, context, season of life. It's almost like I have all the ingredients inside of me to know how to move through the world or to make to make perceptive, I guess, attunements or judgments on things. And the tension point in these paradoxes that I carry inside myself, it feels like that's the most real knowing I have. When I start to lean toward one side of the paradox and say, that's how reality works, or that's the right way to go through something, or that's the right way to see it, I get really one-sided. And I start to have that bias you're talking about because I'm ignoring the polarity opposite or the the paradox opposite of that thing. And so I think that's where, as I'm learning in a postmodern world to move through, it's it's holding both in not tightness, but loosely as possibilities. And it really depends on the context. I think in a postmodern world, context is like king for a lot of these things. And that means we have to get really comfortable with both thinking mm. and thinking. But we as humans love that idea of certainty. Because if you carry paradoxes, that's a very uncertain. You're basically saying, I don't really know. I'm going to carry both of these tensions through the world. And I'm going to give up this addiction to certainty. I'm going to go ahead and just detether from it. I don't have to be an addict to certainty because that's what we all are addicted to. We just want certainty so bad. We'll sacrifice the ability to carry that paradox. Yeah, I suspect that making peace with uncertainty is how we're going to get through postmodernism to get to transmodernism. Yeah. Because postmodern, just like modernism wasn't the acme, postmodern's not the acme either. And um, and postmodernism being like the, the ultimate conclusion to modernism. And so I think transmodernism is going to be the ultimate conclusion to postmodernism. And when I say transmodernism, I mean, I, I don't mean any of the ways that people have hijacked it for their own perspective of reality. I mean, there's like people who talk about transmodernism and have applied what almost look like political views into this world uh, or into this word. And I just mean transmodernism as the the next iteration of modernism after postmodernism. And I think uncertainty, making peace with it and understanding that we just have to go, well, we don't actually know. We don't know. Right, which is the ultimate conclusion to postmodernism, <laughs> is kind of going. Well, I guess we, I guess we don't know. <laughs> when you say transmodernism, does the word uh, "trans" mean transcendent or transition? Uh, transcendent, uh, like like what comes after when we integrate and include postmodernism. Yeah, yeah, transcendent. And so I think that that's uh, that's the next iteration of this, and I think that it will come when we finally collectively recognize that we have to shrug, just like we collectively recognized or collectively enough hidden tipping point of people questioning a modernist viewpoint. That's when we splintered out into postmodernism. And obviously the technology of the internet, I mean, that just catapulted that and made it much, much quicker. That it created an inevitability, that node in the system, that very disruptive node in the system. And I think that uh, that making peace with uncertainty and recognizing that as long as we beat each other over the head, with the other person not agreeing with us and and watch ourselves just constantly and perpetually do that 
oh, you don't agree with me. You're undermining my sense of certainty. Well, now I'm mad at you. And now we're just going to splinter and splinter and splinter and get more and more and more angry with each other for not agreeing with each other. I mean, I, 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 I see, I, I don't know what the disruptive technology is going to be, but there's going to be one. I don't know if it's going to be associated with blockchain or something else, but there's going to be a disruptive technology that points out the absurdity of that. And we're going to have to get to a place where we collectively shrug. But maybe that's just my optimistic view of the future. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could all take each other up before then. We don't blow each other up, right? Yeah. Problem solved. <laughs> and there's no more fighting on the internet <laughs> because there's no more anything. So that said, going back to what is that voice and how can we create a distinction between it and what we want to believe? I think what you were talking about, Joel, is it very much is a part of it that uncertainty, that peace. But I think for me, being able to even know what it is, being able to even hear it has come as a result of the inner work I've done to handle my personal traumas and my my personal obstacles, my gatekeepers that keep me from being able to hear it. I've made this illustration so many times, probably on the podcast itself, that I don't even know where I've said it before. So, you know, the old phrase, stop me if you've heard it. But... <laughs> Back when oh, I, I was, will. Okay. <laughs> oh no, you've heard this one, Joel. You can't stop <laughs> me if you've heard it. <laughs> the person who doesn't have a microphone will have to stop me if they've heard it. So, I, I, my friend, my I, my delightful INTJ friend, who I used to go work out with, you know, twelve years ago now, uh, he was not a person who had ever really worked out. And I, I I've jo I've joined a gym when I was eighteen, and I've been working out ever since. And so I've gone through a you know a whole host of different styles of workout regimes and different personal trainers and all that stuff. And, uh, and so I knew what the word obliques was, right? The obliques are the muscle cluster that is to the sides of your back that kind of um, attach, you know, your, your back to your side effectively. The tenderloin? Is that, is that what Is that what that is? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm bearing up my ignorance of, yeah. <laughs> of cuts of meat. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know either. Anyway, but it's the part that I described and may or may not be the part that you just said. So uh, we were doing these uh, exercises where we were holding a muscle ball uh, or me muscle <laughs> medicine ball that was like 10 or 12 pounds or something. And then, you know, keeping our hips down stationary and then twisting and, you know, back and forth, right to left and back. And I said, this will really help you exercise your oblique muscles and he's like what are the obliques and I walked over and I and I ran my hands up and down where the obliques are for his back and he's like I, I don't know what you're talking about and I'm like well keep doing this and eventually you'll feel them and he's like I don't know what I'm doing and every time we would exercise together and he would do this and I'm, I'm talking about for weeks he'd be like I don't understand what this is doing <laughs> he'd just complain the entire time we would do this exercise and then three weeks in all of a sudden he goes oh <gasps> I feel them. I feel my obliques. <laughs> like it was just his eyes turned to the size of saucers. And it took, I mean, it took three full weeks. And he just all of a sudden said, I feel them. I feel my obliques. And it just was doing it over and over and over. And that has hung with me ever since I had that experience. For anything that is something I'm trying to access, try, something I'm trying to get to, that I don't know what it is originally, but doing an exercise or doing something that allows me access to that part, you know, through other people's recommendations that this is how you do it oftentimes. But eventually you'll feel it. You just don't feel it right now because much like a baby is born effectively blind, even though they have all of the ability to see, it's like they just ha kind of have to get used to the world. They have to be looking at it long enough to start to identify what they're even looking at and seeing these shapes. And then, you know, within a few weeks, they can now see. And it's kind of a similar thing with your inner wisdom. I noticed that whenever I dealt with an insecurity or a wounding inside of me, and I made peace with a part of me that was kind of freaked out by reality. And that's what I see my wounding as. I see my wounding as all of the parts of me that are trying to keep me safe from further pain and suffering. And they become these gatekeepers. They become things that are protectors for my ego to not have to face really unpleasant elements. And when my ego gets really involved, it's usually because the result on the other side is, um, I'm, I'm not that special. I'm just another human in the long line of humans. I get to live now. I get to have the opportunity to make a mark. I get the opportunity to become the best version of myself. And that's it. And pretty soon I'm going to die and nobody will remember who I am and the song will be over. <laughs> and that's it. 
And when my ego really sits with that, it doesn't like that as much. It wants to believe that I'm the center of everything. But the wounding is usually associated with a resistance to that feeling combined with other people treating me in a way that my ego wasn't sure how to handle when it originally happened, oftentimes in childhood. So I dealt with a lot of violence when I was a kid. Uh, I came from a very angry household that, uh, you know, I had experiences where the people in my life who were supposed to be taking care of me were dealing with their own stuff that they hadn't worked through and were working it out on me. And so I ended up integrating a lot of messages about how broken I was and how wrong I was and unacceptable and how I was only useful, uh, I was only lovable if I was useful. And those, you know, those were very, uh, those were very convenient messages for my Enneagram 3 side, (laughs) which already kind of thought that to be the case anyway. So if I got any of those messages, I slurped them up and went, okay, that's how reality works. And as long as I continue to hold on to that wounding and hold on to whatever traumas were associated with it, and my ego got to believe that as long as I'm useful, I'm special, then I was not able to hear my inner wisdom that lived underneath all of that and said, oh, no, that's total bullshit. You don't have to believe any of that. But I was attached to my wounding. I was attached to those messages. My ego had used them to give my sense, myself a sense of specialness or importance, or at least it didn't want to let go of it for whatever reason. And when I worked on those elements, processed them through, dealt with them directly, got to the other side, which is about 15 seconds to say and about 15 years in the making. But when I was able to do all of that processing on the other side, all of a sudden I could quote unquote feel my obliques. I started to hear my inner wisdom talking to me because that sound of the, the, the wounding wasn't a bullhorn on top of it. And that, I think, if a person doesn't know what their inner wisdom or inner voice or inner knowing is trying to communicate with them, it might be because there's a lot of those noises and voices on top of it, a lot of those gatekeepers. And when we don't give each other space to communicate what we're thinking right now, what's going on for us, if we get shouted down by other people and we're not able to process those thoughts through, then we're not able to process those woundings. We're not able to process that trauma. We're not able to express effectively. And expression is a big part of trauma therapy for almost, I mean, in every possible way, right? So when we don't give ourselves that permission to have inner knowing, when we don't allow other people to have that permission when we just find ourselves in constant battles back and forth over these expressions. We don't really own that we've gerrymandered our thoughts to, you know, to match up with a tribal thinking or collectivist thinking in order to feel a higher sense of certainty when we don't see our betraying of those inner voices or our inner wisdom, when we don't own that our wounding is getting in the way and we have a ton of gatekeepers between ourselves and that thought then we're never able to really tap into it and we might not know what that thing is at all because we're not used to hearing it. We're not used to listening to it. And that inner knowing and that, those inner, that inner voice or inner wisdom or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't have all the solutions to, the ma- to major life problems uh, in like a macro way. Like it doesn't necessarily know what to do about the sex trafficking industry. It doesn't know what to do about climate change. It doesn't necessarily know what to do about all of these big, big, big challenges, but it does know the direction we need to go as individuals. And sometimes it encourages us to become the kind of people who can create solutions to those challenges and problems. It can encourage us, c- encourage us to take steps to be able to address things directly. And sometimes it doesn't, but it at least lets us on our path. It lets us know where we need to go. And I don't know if all of those things require statistics or data or studies to, uh, to sort of um, underpin those directions. Like we're allowed to have our takes. We're allowed to see things the way that we want to see them. And to not, to not have other people dogpile us and say that we are a danger to them, that we're creating an unsafe space for them or that they don't feel safe in our presence 
because we disagree with them. Like, like that's not, uh, th- that's basically saying my ego is now being threatened. Like you're making me reevaluate what I think and you're making me acknowledge that I might have some wounding that requires addressing. And I don't like that because I'm not ready to deal with that. And I'm not ready to tap into and listen to that inner wisdom. And, uh, and that's not really our problem if somebody else is in that position. Uh, and so I, I don't think that we have to underpin everything we do with proof. Like I think we can have knowing and that's okay too. About a year ago, Dr. Dario Nardi came to stay with us, me and Antonia at our house and our studios because we have our studios here at our house. And we were spending about a month, three to four weeks producing the Young on Yoga program, which is basically our you know personality types in yoga where Dr. Nari was going through Jung's Travels to India. Anyway, I don't know why I'm getting the weeds on that. We were producing that program. He was staying with us and we went, we live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We took him out to the battlefield, the federal battlefield here, uh, national battlefield, Gettysburg battlefield. And there's a part called Devil's Den, which is where a part of the battle happened. And this big rocks and there's where snipers were set up during the battle. And you can actually go there and walk around and look at the battlefield and all the things there. And it's actually, I don't know if you know this or not, but Gettysburg's a huge ghost hunting town. (laughs) There's like probably six to eight companies every night of the week, probably in the spring, summer, and fall, going out doing ghost tours all all over the town and also on the battlefield. And Devil's Den's a big ghost area. Whether you believe in it or not, it's just, it's what happens here. And so, you know, there's, there's a sense of people tapping into the energy of things on the battlefield. And, you know, me and Piper, my daughter, and Antonia and Dario went out to Devil's Den. And we're, Piper and I are two e- ENPs jumping around on the rocks, you know, kind of talking loudly and having a really good time of, of exploration that's very outwardly, externally focused. And I noticed Dario is just very quietly walking along and placing his hands on the rocks. He's an INTJ, you know, INTJ preferences. And he's just touching the rocks and kind of quietly to himself, walking and strolling along. And I remember stopping for a moment and going over to him and saying, so, so what's, uh, what's happening? Are, are, the rocks, are the rocks speaking to you? Kind of half joking. He said, well, there are messages here if I can slow my frequencies down enough to, to listen to them. And, you know, regardless of what you think about the supernatural or, or not, there are energies and frequencies around us that if we slow ourselves down to, we probably can hear. And it just... That story of that experience made me think about our inner space too. That that inner vis- wisdom, inner voice, inner knowing, it seems to be. I mean, my inner knowing says it's a still small voice. It's a quiet voice. It's something that the frequency inside of myself has to be slowed down to. I think this is why meditation is so powerful. I think this is why rumination and quiet thoughtfulness is so powerful for us as humans because we slow down the frequency inside of ourselves to hear some of that inner wisdom because it's not going to be megaphone bombastic screaming at us. I mean, sometimes I guess it can throw a fit and say, you've got to listen to me. This is an inner wisdom. Don't do this thing or whatever. But often it's a quiet, still, small voice inside. At least that's been my experience. And I think that's been a lot of other people's experiences I've talked to. And so I think if you took anything away from this podcast, it's that really quieting your environment and quieting all the noise and the social noise and the collective noise and the, you know, the inner noise even inside of yourself, almost like a snow globe that's got all this flurries everywhere. You just let it settle for a moment and tap into what is that voice trying to communicate to you? Do, do you have an ability to build a relationship with that voice? Maybe there's a way you can just right now, just bring yourself to a calm, still space just to be open to listening. Maybe there's nothing that's to be said right now but just the willingness to approach this part of yourself in a humble way, in an open way, to say, what messages does this part of me have for myself? What still small voice messages can I hear here if I slow the frequency of my life down? And man, I'm saying something that, as I'm listening to myself say this, I'm like, yeah, Joel, how are you going to do that in your own life? Like, I mean, it's, it's so hard in our modern world, right? I've got a podcast to record this week. I got to output. I've got to go do this thing. I got to file this paperwork. I got to do this business thing. I take my car to fix, get fixed. It's, I got to handle my kids. I got to make dinner, you know, like just the, just the living life, let alone all the, the assault of media and quote unquote studies that I lamented at the very beginning coming at me. <laughs> like how can, it's such a challenge to sift through all that and just get to a present moment of stillness to listen. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that that is ultimately the message. You know, as I was I was reflecting, you know, now that the we're we're at the completion of this podcast. I'm assuming, right? We're winding this down, line in the plane. Yeah, I think so. Because what you just said was a beautiful little ribbon on top. So uh, I I feel like that's a really good landing of the plane, slowing things down. As our friend Betsy Garman says, slowing things down to the speed of listening. I think that's brilliant. I I think I'm unsatisfied with a lot of the things that we mentioned in this podcast because it's so hard to really communicate and, and create clarity around these points because a lot of it is not digital. It's an analog experience of getting inside of that. And it's really easy to conflate a lot of these things. It's really easy to, you know, it's like, are we talking about news pieces? Are we talking about piece of people's opinions that are supposed to be based on data and information? Or are we talking about something that's a little more abstract and esoteric, like an inner knowing about things? Like, what exactly are we talking about here? And are we creating good enough distinctions to really speak on these things? Or are we conflating them together? And the part of me that's a little dissatisfied by not slicing these things as cleanly as we possibly could and creating all these really perfect distinctions and matching them all up, another part of me is okay with that too because I think it's something that we need to sit with (laughs) and create distinctions inside of ourselves. I think the idea of where do our data-driven opinions really come from Are they coming from something that is fed by this voice that you're talking about, which they should be? Like the things we quote unquote know about life in the world, the things that we're asserting to other people that are opinions that quote unquote everybody should be holding. Everybody should be agreeing with me. I think in and of itself is a denial of the idea that there is an inner wisdom and an inner voice that is guiding all of us. And should we be listening to that voice or should we only be taking information that is objectively true at the moment that it is released? And to me, the inner wisdom, the inner voice that we listen to and hear based on a slowing down and a, as you mentioned, Joel, and a removal of the wounding and the gatekeepers that keep us from hearing it, that's a far more consistent and steady message than the information we get in the outside world that alters and changes based on new information and or biases and misinformation. The biggest challenge with our world right now and this idea of misinformation, it makes me think of a friend of mine who was a very successful CEO of a company. When he would hire for C-level executives, he would say, "Um, what's people's biggest misperception about you? That was one of the questions he asked in hiring. And then the person would say what the biggest misperception was. And he'd say, what's the difference between perception and misperception? And almost always the person would just go, uh, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because people's opinions of you, are they perceptions or are they misperceptions? And I think about that every time I hear the word misinformation. I'm like, okay, well, what's the biggest piece of misinformation? And how do we know that that's not information? Right. Well, it's like because of studies, <laughs> because of data. <laughs> I mean, there are things that are objectively untrue. But most of the time, the things that are un- objectively untrue are not things that anybody believes anyway. This is why they talk about the teacup that goes around the moon. Nobody believes that there's a teacup going around the moon. Right. This is this is a uh, th- this is supposed to be an argument that you know, owns religious people. <laughs> but the the reality is that a teacup going around the moon is not a religion. Nobody religiously believes that. Nobody worships a teacup going around the moon because everybody rejects it because it's just patently untrue. And if you do, write in. We want to hear that one guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's always one guy. <laughs> and that said, when something is has no merit in reality, almost always 99.9% of people's brains just go, that's, that's ridiculous. Well, and the reason I said that is because if I was hearing that, that you just said that teacup, I'm like, of course there is. There's somebody that believes that. That's, okay. Immediately I would snap to that. Yeah. Right. Because we also live in a negation culture. Anything you posit, it's like, well, no, that's here's exception, negation, exception, negation, you know, all this stuff. Absolutely. You're totally right. We do live in a culture of people who get off on that, <laughs> on negating everything. <laughs> well, because it makes us feel super smart, right? Yeah. We're negating what other people say because we're super smart and we know the truth, right? And you're right. There is always one person. And when it comes to things that are complete disinformation, like the ones that go opposite of reality, it's such a small percentage of people who believe it. It's ridiculous. 
But if a group of people believe it, right, there must be something to it. So is that misinformation or is it just not a complete truth? And most of the time, the things that are quote unquote misinformations are just not complete truths. They're partial truths. There's a piece of it that's true, but not a complete truth. And I don't know very many people who have a complete truth. So on some level, all of us have misinformation. And on some level, all of us have information as well. And I think the reason why that to me is important to remember is that the inner knowing piece is way more consistent for me. It's way more consistent than information and misinformation arguments going back and forth. The inner knowing is a much clearer, more consistent guide. Even if it doesn't tell me all the solutions to all the problems of the world, it certainly helps me as an individual make much better choices and have a much stronger trajectory in my own personal life. And so, as I mentioned, there could be, I mean, I'm sure we could have done a a gajillion times better job creating all these distinctions and and saying this and communicating and articulating it better. But I think I think at the end of the day, it's okay for it to be just a little jumbled because I think it is important for every person to sit with that and try to figure out what are the distinctions around all of this. How is my inner wisdom communicating to me things that are helping me create worldviews and opinions? Or is it not at all? And what's the difference? And how would I know? I think it's okay to make it a little vague yeah. in order to really have that sense of introspection. And uh, and so I hope I, I hope that we haven't done a disservice here by we, not having it perfect. We haven't. But I also think it's an important topic to point out. Even if my, my finger isn't the moon, even if I yeah. haven't done a beautiful job, I hope I've at least pointed to something that somebody else can, in their own mind, do a better job of creating distinction for themselves. Well, and this is where, I mean, as an ENTP, Antonio, you have ENTP preferences. You always want to give those distinctions and land the plane and have it nicely clean sliced for people. But I see this as a very inspirational podcast. You listening to ask yourself these questions. It's, a, it's inspiring you to go on this journey of discovery, not try to provide the answers, but just give some ideas on thinking about it. And, and speaking of that, what do you think about this? What's coming up for you intuitively, maybe imaginatively, maybe that inner know, knowing or wisdom is speaking to you as you're listening? And what are you hearing from those messages? We want to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. You can leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story, maybe share your perspective, philosophy, some of the ideas that are emerging for you that you're probably having some complexity around as they come up. Because I think this is a very complex topic and these are complex ideas. And we'd love to hear your individual expression. Mm. And if you enjoyed this podcast, if you're one of those people who we picked up during the 16 type interviews and you're like, what is this? (laughs) We do these sometimes. Every once in a while we go off on a tangent. Um, But if you enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you leave us leave us a rating and review on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. And by helps us out, I mean spiritually. My soul gets renewed when I see she an does. iTunes yeah, review. I read them all. So if you want to give us a gift in return, then you can go leave us an iTunes review. Uh, you can also get a copy of our book, Personality Hacker. It's available at all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. We have a suite of programs that are designed to help you become the best version of yourself. Taking this idea of personality type and not just keeping it theoretical, not just constantly and perpetually expanding on the system, but really connecting it to real world situations, real world application. How does understanding type help you have an experience with the self and become the best version of yourself? That is always our guiding star. So if you are ready to take your personal growth to the next level, we invite you to come over to Personality Hacker and check out our catalog of programs and see if there's one that's right for you in this moment of the timeline. What are you dealing with? Do we have something that can help guide your progress? Something that will make it a little faster to get through? Go check it out and see if there's one that is right for you. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. 
We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.